Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation. This time on Colores. Spanish photographer Yanira Najera discovers another side of New Mexico's nuclear history. It really inspired me, you know, the, the black hole kind of told another story, another side of the history of Los Alamos, and now that it's gone, it doesn't play that role. Feminist painter Stephanie Rond often incorporates 1950s advertising in her work. Discussing gender and humor go together because I want people to be comfortable with the artwork right away and then kind of see that there's an underlying topic there. Known for an anti-establishment perspective, graffiti artist Barry McGee breaks the mold at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. I think in his work, a sort of an homage or sort of an honoring another community that's in the shadows. Philadelphia art teachers introduce children to art inside and outside the classroom. I want to have my kids understand the connection between still life and food. It's all ahead on Colores. Photographer and filmmaker Yanira Najera documented Los Alamos' legendary black hole as it was being liquidated. Identity is, is always interesting me, mainly because I think sometimes I feel that I, I'm not sure where I belong to, and it seems that sometimes we need to establish where we are from to start some kind of dialogue with other people. Personally, I have worked in other projects in the past where a place all of a sudden stopped being there or it has stopped its function. And sometimes the objects that you can find in that place is the only way that you can get some kind of inside view. They are the only traces that you can connect to what really happened there and what was really important for the communities that were associated to these places. The black hole was the brainchild of Ed Grothos, and he worked in the lab. He came to Los Alamos in 1949, working like a machinist. But I think during the Vietnam War, he felt that it was an unjust war, and he felt he could no longer work at the laboratory. I really felt amazed by the amount of objects and all the scientific array and equipment that was still on display, and that was going to disappear because they were liquidating. I felt like some kind of need to have to go and document it. What I felt attracted to this project and the black hole in general, I think it was Ed's personality, even I didn't know him myself, through colleagues and friends, I got to know him a little bit. My father, like a lot of the people who worked here, really enjoyed technology, and he really enjoyed beautiful and clever machinery. And my father saved everything. He was born in the Depression, and he learned never, you don't waste anything, you never throw anything away. The obvious that you could find in the black hole, they were really bizarre. I mean, they were 30, 40, 50 year old, and in a way, the engineering and the craftsmanship of these objects is quite unique. Some of the objects were not related with lab equipment, but they were still used within the laboratory most of the times, and I guess Ed as well purchased objects from other sources, and eventually they made it to the black hole. Mainly for me, is because I don't have a science background, I didn't understand the function of all of these objects, and it was a little bit playful. During the liquidation cell, I set up a background studio just outside the shop with a roll of uh, scientific grade Myla. So it was important to reuse some parts of the store to, to undertake this series. The idea was to photograph people 
after they purchased their objects on the way out, so not to disrupt how the liquidation cell was working, and a little bit to, to just analyze why are you interested in this object. All the kids that visit the, the black hole on that weekend, they could get free objects. And some of the families that were in the black hole, the same, they were trying to, to educate their children a little bit in what the function of these objects were. And some of them, a, a really interesting family, they just bought some materials to work on the weekend projects with the kids. One of the other things that really touched me was this little kid, uh, and he just bought a Bible. I don't know how, but he found a Bible in the black hole and he thought it was a sweet present for his mom. I talked to, to some of the scientists that were there purchasing objects, uh, a really young scientist, you know, that he just bought a Mac, a computer, and obviously told me, you know, I just want to reuse this in a different way, I'm an engineer. People buying microscopes, lots of lens equipment, things that you find in the lab, that honestly it's really hard to find these days in other places. I think most of the people were really excited for visiting the black hole, Lots of people were really sad because they knew that resource was going to stop right there and they were regular visitors, most of them. So I think being there in, in the last days, it had an emotional charge for them. And other people that was there for the first time could not believe why they had not been there before. There are all, all sorts of artists, uh, aside from the people who, who need things for technical reasons. Uh, mechanical reasons to buy things here. All sorts of artists come here and he's, my father became sort of known in the arts community as a good source for cool things. He, he didn't uh, necessarily feel like he had to sell anything, uh, you know, it was kind of if he wanted to sell anything and, and uh, many of the artists and, and regular people would come in and, you know, they'd have to go through a negotiation phase with him to to get things. There are some really beautiful things and it's hard not to think about um, trying to figure a way to make something beautiful. The craftsmanship and the engineering that went into just the construction of the materials, not including the, you know, the conceptual construction, um, is just something you don't see. Mainly because of Ed Grothos, I got inspired by him and not everyone tries to change the world and I believe that he in some, in some ways he really tried to tell us and make us aware that maybe nuclear energy is not the way forward. So I think I have the same personal views regarding nuclear energy that I had before. I think maybe now I have a little bit more strong feelings about it. With this project, hopefully, I'm helping to share the vision of EDS and the black hole vision. So just by being the channel, the vehicle of communicating this, I think the legacy, in a way, it remains and it still is, is there for other people to learn from it. So coming back to the identity a little bit, I think it really inspired me, you know, the, the black hole kind of told another story, another side of the history of Los Alamos, and now that it's gone, it doesn't play that role. And I guess I'm just interested in people, really, and in people's stories, and through learning from other people, sometimes I just learn about myself, and we all live in the same kind of roof, but we still don't know each other, and, and that's it. With my projects, I just try to step back a little bit and just think, uh, because we are going so fast these days. So that's what I think art can do a little bit, can help us to stop and analyze different themes. Feminist painter Stephanie Rond shares her journey as an artist and social activist. I actually got started in art probably in 10th grade is when I became very serious about it. I've always been into art. That's where I felt like my voice was strongest. I always like a new challenge of how to say what I want to say in a new way. 
I use paints that are man-made. There's something about the aesthetic of that plastic quality that I am drawn to. And I also do a lot with old advertisements from the 50s. It's already something that's in our culture, and I like taking that and making a new story with it. I researched probably thousands of 50s ads to find the ones that I wanted to use. To me, that search helps bring in the story. With the new work that I'm doing, it's very text involved. I was in a punk rock band for five years, and that kind of changed what I thought about the written word as a way to get people to start the story where I want them to start the story in my paintings and then jump off from that text. I have been a feminist painter for the past probably 17 years. I feel like that's where my voice is in my artwork is um, talking about the inequalities that still exist between men and women. Discussing gender and humor go together because I want people to be comfortable with the artwork right away and then kind of see that there's an underlying topic there. So I've always been interested in the female aspect of art making and, and the idea of handmade craft and thinking about like women's work and how women have been making artwork forever. It's not really considered an art form. I really like the idea of the labor behind lace or cross stitch or embroidery. Street art and graffiti is actually the other half of the artwork that I'm making right now. That's a very male dominated art still, but I like taking the styles that they're using and incorporating it into my work. So it's kind of two separate things that talk to each other. If I can make artwork where people can have discussions about inequality, it doesn't matter race, gender, sexual preference, we should all be considered equals. I enjoy making art spaces where they don't exist to kind of give quality back to the community. There's definitely an art to putting a show together and making sure that this piece that's next to this piece is talking correctly. The first place I started curating at was the Carnegie Gallery, which is at the main library. And they had built a gallery, but they weren't putting art in there. So I asked to start getting nonprofits to come in and have shows. With 2,000 people coming into the library every day, that's a huge audience. The kind of art that I bring to the Carnegie are actually large organizations, large nonprofits. For example, the Ohio Art League or Roy G. Bibb. And what we do there is we put out a call for entry and we will have 40 to 50 artists look at a theme to go into the show. Holy Craft is actually a newer venture. It is a handmade goods store. It's actually part of the DIY, kind of the punk rock culture. It goes along a lot with my artwork. It's got a lot of wit and humor. It's not your grandmother's craft store. We wanted to have this gallery because there isn't much difference between craft and art, so it was just a natural progression to put art and craft together. Some of the challenges that I face working as an artist today is the economy. The art world's getting very hit by that. People don't realize that it's not a luxury, that it's a necessity. It is what we are as human beings. It's how we communicate with each other. It's about human expression. Anybody should have the right to be able to express themselves. Street artist Barry McGee displays his work at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Find artist Barry McGee in the galleries of his retrospective at Boston's Institute of Contemporary Art, and you find a man in conflict. He's in tension with his life's work. It's, it's maybe like seeing a, yeah, it's maybe like seeing an old friend that you never f quite finished the um, relationship with, right? Or mm. it's a little bit awkward. He's at odds with particular pieces. I wish it would go away. It's so, so obnoxious back there. Was it, was it the Branch Davidians in, in Waco, Texas? Yeah. Remember when they were using music to like get, get them to try to come out of the compound? Like This thing's been going for like the last half, like two days here. And for the man whose acclaim is derived from very public street art, the confines of the museum confound him. Going back indoors is like going backwards a little bit to me. Your audience is, it's, it's, 
it starts reducing the audience. There is a palpable sensitivity to Barry McGee, a one-time graffiti artist who made his mark in San Francisco beginning in the early 1990s. Much of the show is populated with his melancholic figures, a reflection of the city's large homeless population, one that he encountered working, he says, late at night on San Francisco's fringe. That would be the population you're in touch with a lot yeah. when you're like uh, behind buildings and stuff. So it was, uh, yeah, it was an interesting to talk and just find out how people like end up in situations. I think in his work, a sort of uh, an homage or sort of an honoring another culture that's in the shadows, um, or community, I should say, a community that's in the shadows. The ICA's Janelle Porter curated the McGee Show, which takes us from the artist's earliest days, a time saturated in earthy brown and red tones, to a vibrant venture into abstraction. He also is just maturing more, looking at more art, thinking about more histories of painting and of art, but also trying to find a way to incorporate all of the like excess of the street in a way that was perhaps more abstracted. Here he comments on and uses excess. That blaring video tower, the dumpster bin, which has been inhabited, all created from found or discarded objects. I like to use anything outside of the art store for material, not, not going into art stores or that just became the material I think for me. Just as his life and culture is. For all of the darkness in tone, the biting commentary on consumption, the artist also has a crafty comedic side in the guise of animatronics, which Porter says is McGee at his deadpan best. I also think of it as sort of a diorama, like of the sort of, <laughs> this is the habitat of the, of the graffiti writer. Um, but as well, I think there's something um, that can be, there's something quite primitive, one could say, in doing graffiti, like if you want to trace it all the way back to cave paintings, like leaving your mark. And now it is also the mark of the mainstream in museums, troubling as that may be for a man of conflict like Barry McGee. Philadelphia teachers strive to introduce children to art. Fresh Artists is a nonprofit that was started in Philadelphia in 2008. And it was started because we saw something broken, something that needed to be fixed. Art being challenged and, and removed, supplies being removed from the, from the shelves of the public schools in Philadelphia. And we saw teachers being stressed uh, with the lack of resources. Everything is on fish station for you. I was lucky to have a school that really wanted to have art making in their school. Here we go. All the painters sit together if you're at that stage so they can share the same materials. To give me kids creative. The only thing that we focus on right now is reading math and science. But what you know, my principal, uh, Mr. Evans, and our leadership team really focus on is that there are other things and kids have to be creative because if they're not, then they're unable to do other things because they're constantly searching for what's the right answer instead of what are all of the possibilities and what are all of the right answers. We had just done a big project to decorate the 440 North Broad Street, which is the headquarters of the school district of Philadelphia. Instead of framing small pieces of children's art and putting it on the wall in a predictable way, we came up with an idea of digitizing the art, taking a really, really high uh, resolution photograph and blowing the things up really huge. We decorated the whole building 850,000 square feet. One day we realized, what about starting a nonprofit so that if children would donate the use of these beautiful images, we would go to big corporations and businesses and ask them for donations. We would take the donations and pour the money directly into art supplies and innovative art programs in the city. Then we would give the people who made the donations art for their walls. Cups? Yes. 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 Repeat after me, we are? We are. The French Laundry? The French Laundry. And we are? And we are. The best? The best. And we? And we. Act like it? And we act like it. Cooks? Cooks. I've worked at Southwest Leadership Academy for about a year, and actually teachers always need a second job. I've been working in Philadelphia's restaurant industry for about 11 years. I work at Zahav as a food runner, and I work at Pub and Kitchen as a server. And I came up with this idea that I wanted kids to be able to experience what 
going to a restaurant feels like and that culture of sitting down and having a great meal. So I approached Barbara um, and Fresh Artists to say, I have this really weird idea. I want to have my kids understand the connection between still life and food. Mini Masterpieces is a very interesting program where we take kids into museums to look at masterpieces, then they create a masterpiece of their own. The Fresh Artists Collaborative Palace to Palettes is really a huge project that goes in four phases. Uh, phase one is the students going to the Barnes Foundation to study still life and food. Now, if you're going to break this part down, and so basically what would it Phase two is for the students to go to the restaurants um, and have still life set up by world-class photographers, Mike, Michael Persico and Susan Beard. Um, eat with the chefs, meet the chefs, and have the chef's signature dish. Phase three is the students coming back to Southwest Leadership Academy and making art for about two to three months based on the still life that they saw at their restaurants. Small square tables. The walls were beautiful because they was my favorite color, blue. The tables were set really nicely. Behind the tables, they had our project that we were supposed to draw. It was called Duck L'Orange. On the plate, it had the duck, Brussels sprouts, and black garlic on the sides. At first, I was pretty nervous on what colors to add, so I asked my teacher, Miss Watson, what colors and she told me that I needed to go with some warm colors and some cool colors. So for my background I used a cool color and I used that color because it makes the images pop. Running a classroom like a kitchen is operates on French military systems of organization. So when I say cooks, it's yes chef, or if you're in the military, it's yes sir, very immediately. Um, it's that system of respect, um, the system of hierarchy. I have chef de cuisines who are two people that can walk around the classroom and get things for other people. They know where everything is. I have sous chefs who are table captains and who take care of, you know, really picking up for others that, you know, do slack in terms of cleanup. And then everyone else is a line cook that is generally constantly working at a quiet intensity of we work hard, we work clean, and we work fast, and we're producing artwork. And if you want to be a doctor, you got to be an intern. And if you want to be a lawyer, you got to you know push file paper everywhere. There's a start to everything, and even in my classroom, I hope that they learn that something is a start to something greater. I went to Spraga. Um, the chef that I met was Kevin Spraga. Um, I was very, very shocked that I was going to be standing in front of him at the time. Uh, but it was a good experience to be there. Kevin expressed his thoughts about what it is as far as space and timing and pace matching in the kitchen. Um, yeah, and then we had a tour around the actual restaurant and then we were seated to um, start our drawing of the food that was being placed in front of us. Once the class is finished with the artwork, uh, then we will take the artwork to the chefs. Each chef will pick their choix de chef, the, the, the chef's choice. Mm -hmm. Those pieces will be rescanned and we will start to produce that large image in our workshop at Fresh Artists. There will be a big community art show at the school, at the school mm -hmm. in June. We've been invited to bring some of the community that has supported DIVA and Fresh mm -hmm. Artists in the city, led by Gary Stoyer, the mayor, mayor's cultural officer, to a party at Le Becfin, which will occur in June, um, and uh, where the entire body of the project will be shown. That looks so much nicer. Look. Wow. That looks so nice. Look at this. That looks beautiful. Isn't it interesting when it blows up? It's so different, isn't it? Yeah. 
This is real empowerment when you take this in tomorrow. People feel very powerless sometimes being a teacher in Philadelphia, especially at this time. And I feel like fresh artists and the restaurant industry, they really have my back. So I feel very powerful in a somewhat, I would say, powerless situation. Next time on Colores, Santa Fe's Jeremy Thomas shares his fiery sculpture process in a film by Rick Serena. And one of the aspects of the work are, is the form, and it's all based off of circle geometries. Blacksmiths at Eureka Ford Studio work with metals utilizing centuries-old traditions. From your imagination, we forge reality. And uh, if you can think it up, we can, we can make it. Harley-Davidson is the oldest American motorcycle company. Now the founders were working in a very small shed behind the, the Davidson family home. It was only 10 feet by 15 feet. But they had all of the resources that they needed, machine shops, tanneries, etc., right in their own neighborhood. So that really helped to facilitate what they were doing. Jewelry designer Andrea Lee shares her inspiration. A lot of people will get inspiration from nature or a poem or a song. I get inspiration from nature, but it's in the form of beautiful glittering gemstones. Until next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>